everyone. We're glad you're here. Thanks for taking your time this morning on a Friday to uh, join us for our Latte and Learn. I'm excited for this morning. I'm Josh White. I'm the CAR Professional Development Master Group Chair this, this uh, year, and I'm welcoming, welcoming you to the June Latte and Learn. Uh, both the CAR Professional Development Master Group and also the Blue Ridge Home Builders Association are exciting to continue the Green Building Series today. Um, this series was produced to help you understand the various green components in relation to planning, design, construction, maintenance, renovation, and demolition. Today's session will cover building envelope, and we're really fortunate to have two speakers with us, um, James Sullenberger of Weather Seal Company, and then AJ Worth of Creative Conservation. Before we get started, I just want to take a quick minute to remind you that today's participants are the a great incentive that we have going through the National Association of Realtors uh, for their green designation, which is the two-day course in October that we're going to be offering. If you attend four out of the five latte learn um, things that we're having on Fridays, um, then you will get a hundred dollar discount on the designation course, and that's a savings of 50%. Registration is open for the remainder of the Latte and Learn Green Building sessions on the CAR Education and Events calendar. Interesting fact, um, only 2.6% of the CAR membership has the green designation, so it's a great way to stand out from your competitors. I also want to thank um, our Green Building Series sponsors. Um, so the presenting sponsor is the Virginia Credit Union. Thank you guys so much. And then event sponsors include Birch Studio, Fulton Mortgage Company, Guaranteed Rate, UVA Community Credit Union, and member options. They're helping to make this incentive possible for us. And since you are not able to visit with these sponsors in person, please review the handouts to learn more about the companies. Okay, we're going to get started with today's session. James and AJ, I'm going to hand the session over to you both, and we can start. All right. Uh, thanks for having us, Josh. Appreciate you bringing us in to talk about uh, the building envelope, uh, something that you all may or may not be familiar with, but uh, hopefully we can discuss it a little and uh, leave you having learned something. Uh, I'm James Sullenberger. I'm with Weather Seal Insulation here in Charlottesville. Uh, we're an insulation, uh, waterproofing, and crawl and basement remediation company. Um, and yeah, I guess we can jump right in. Uh, so today we are learning about the building envelope uh, and some opportunities for improving and air sealing it. Um, are you all seeing my screen here? PowerPoint. Do I need to? You'll need to, yeah, share your screen. Oh, there we go. Got it now. pop up for you. Are y'all getting the PowerPoint now? Yes, we can see it. Oh, good. All right. Uh, so yeah, let's jump right in here. There we go. Uh, so today, uh, we'll, by attending this session, we'll be able to differentiate between the pressure and thermal boundaries and describe the behavior and function of each. Uh, this is basically identifying the shell of the building, which is what separates the living space uh, from the outdoor space, uh, where that occurs, which, which can be different uh, depending on how the house is set up and um, benefits of uh, different areas uh, or having it set up in, in one manner or another. Uh, we'll summarize the basic principles of air leakage. Uh, air leakage occurs when you have a hole and a pressure differential uh, between two spaces. Uh, you can have air infiltration, uh, which is outside air coming into the house, or exfiltration, which is inside air leaving the house. Uh, neither are beneficial when they're not controlled uh, by, say, an HVAC system. That's just uh, you losing conditioned air or outside air coming in that you'll then have to condition. Uh, we'll identify the proper location of the pressure and thermal boundaries. Uh, the main thing we want to be aware of here is that we want the thermal boundary and uh, the pressure boundary, your, your air barrier and your thermal barrier 
touching each other. Um, if they're not touching each other, your, your insulation's ineffective uh, and you have air leakage. Uh, we'll identify common sites and signals of breaks in the pressure and thermal boundaries, uh, windows, doors, holes in the ceiling, uh, holes in the floor system, fireplaces, uh, we could go on and on, and some common materials that can be used uh, to air seal the home uh, and improve the air and thermal boundary. Um, we'll explain what's meant by inside and outside in terms of the air barrier. That's basically what is part of the home and what is outside. You have conditioned crawls, uh, which are, which a lot of you have probably seen in new construction, uh, which are considered to be part of the house because they're conditioned like the rest of the house and you have vented crawls, uh, which are still part of the home, but it's considered outside the home. Uh, and the same goes for attics. Uh, you have conditioned attics now with spray foam applied to the roof line. Um, you treat the attic like it's part of the house. It gets heated and cooled. The humidity gets managed. Um, or you have a vented attic where you see uh, blown or fiberglass bat insulation on the attic floor. Uh, those attics are vented. Uh, outside air comes in and they would be considered outside the home um, and would be treated as such. A comfortable, safe, efficient home uh, requires a fully insulated thermal envelope or thermal boundary. That means every part of the home uh, should be separated from the outside uh, or the living space. Everything should be treated with insulation. Uh, if you have a hole in the insulation, you don't have a proper thermal envelope. Uh, a well-sealed air barrier, uh, this can be difficult to achieve. You have windows, doors, uh, wire holes, complicated framing methods uh, that lend itself to deficiencies in the air barrier uh, and opportunities for air to migrate in and out of the home. Uh, continuous thermal air and air barriers that are in contact with an one another. Again, we already touched on that. If your insulation and air barrier are not touching each other, uh, the thermal barrier is not effective. Uh, you need efficient, properly sized equipment to condition the living space. If your equipment's too big, uh, won't run long enough, and does not remove humidity like it should. Uh, if it's too small, uh, it's not uh, gonna keep up with the, the, the heating and air needs of the house and you'll, you'll end up with an uncomfortable house. Uh, the ducts should be well-designed uh, to and balanced, uh, should, should distribute the air in a balanced method. Otherwise, areas of the house are hot and cold. Um, people are uncomfortable and um, healthy indoor air quality, uh, which can be an issue if you don't have a proper air thermal barrier because things like crawl space mold can come into the house or uh, attic dust, dirt, debris, et cetera. Here's an image of just some common spots where you might see leakage in your building envelope. Uh, you have an attic hatch that's not sealed. Uh, air from the attic moves in and out. Recessed lights are notorious for leaking large amounts of air. Uh, if they're not properly sealed or not airtight, uh, recessed light, uh, a model that it's air sealed in and of itself. Uh, vent stacks going up through the attic. Kitchen range hoods can be common spots for air to leak in. Bath fans, uh, dryer vents, all, all of these areas if they're not treated properly, allow outside air to enter the building envelope uh, in an uncontrolled manner. Um, here's a graph of the common areas for air leakage in a home and on average, the percentage of uh, what where the leakage occurs. Um, as you can see, a lot of people go right to windows for air leakage. Uh, people want to replace the windows, which is really expensive. Uh, but as you can see here, it only generally accounts for about 12% of the air leakage in a home, where if you start looking at treating your attics, walls, uh, and ceilings, that's 36% that's of your leakage that occurs there. Or perhaps just sealing a couple of fireplaces that maybe don't have flues on them. Uh, or dampers on them, uh, which can be leaking even more air than your windows uh, and are incredibly easy to uh, resolve. 
a few typical hot spots or flues for plumbing vents, uh, wire holes drilled between the walls into the attic or the crawl space. Uh, again, recessed light fixtures, chimneys, and uh, you can see the guy there with the smoke pen. Oftentimes, uh, you, you test a house with a blower door, which sucks the air out of a house, and you, you go around with the smoke pen, and you can you can see where the air is leaking in and out by holding holding it up to that area, puffing some smoke, and seeing seeing the smoke move into the attic or uh, attic air being blown into the house. Or I know many of you have probably been in an attic and seen dirty, uh, discolored insulation. Usually, if you pull back that insulation you'll see a hole in the ceiling uh, where air is moving in and out of the home and the fiberglass is, or, or blown insulation is acting like a filter instead of an insulator. Um, and that's, that's causing the discoloration uh, and creating an opportunity to seal a hole. Uh, for maximum efficiency and comfort, you want the air and thermal boundaries to be in continuous contact. Again, if, if your insulation is not touching your air barrier, your insulation is not effective. Now, the air barrier in this picture is, is being shown as the drywall uh, and the flooring. The, the air barrier can occur on the inside or the outside of a home. Uh, either one of them is effective as long as they're done properly. Uh, I would say more often than not in our climate and uh, with the housing stock we see here, the drywall of the house is considered your air barrier. Um, and you'll be looking for any hole in your drywall into the wall cavity where air could be leaking in. Um, the thermal boundary again limits heat flow between inside and out and is easily identifiable by the presence of insulation. So the, the thermal barrier is essentially where the insulation goes in the house, the walls, the attic floor, the roof line, uh, the crawl space walls, the crawl space ceiling. The, it, it can be any of many different areas, uh, just depends on how the house is set up. Um, even small areas and the insulation, uh, missing insulation are important and can reduce the overall thermal performance by up to 50%. Here's an example of a thermal boundary on the attic floor of a home. You can see the blown insulation here. Uh, the depth levels are all over the place. It's really dirty, uh, likely a lot of penetrations in the drywall below it, which is creating the air barrier um, and, and an overall poor insulation job here uh, filled with deficiencies. Uh, in this case, we've moved the thermal boundary to the roof line. I'm sure a lot of you have seen a foamed roof system before. Uh, you're keeping the mechanical system inside the building envelope, uh, treating the attic as a conditioned space and using a product uh, in spray foam that creates both an air barrier and insulator. So an air and thermal boundary all in one. Uh, it's one of the big benefits of spray foam is that it makes up for a lot of the deficiencies uh, in other areas of construction by, by air sealing and insulating at the same time. Uh, an air barrier limits the flow of air between the inside and outside of a building. Uh, can be one of the more difficult things to identify in a building. What is the air barrier? Is it the exterior skin of the building? Is it the drywall? Is it the roof? Is it the crawl space wall? Um, but making sure that the air barrier um, is identified and continuous is important in terms of having an energy efficient home. Um, and again, one of the areas uh, where a lot of mistakes are made during the construction process uh, that cause for energy efficiency deficiencies. So here, here you have an air barrier uh, attempting to be created on the outside of a home uh, with Tyvek, which I'm sure everybody has seen before, uh, the white stuff that goes over the framing uh, or over the sheathing of the house before siding goes on. And, and this product is intended to create an air and water barrier, uh, but so often it's installed improperly 
And that's why the drywall of the house becomes the air barrier um, because the Tyvek install uh, was done wrong and therefore it just can't be considered an air barrier. Um, on the left here, you see Tyvek installed uh, with a ton of staples um, and the seams of the Tyvek aren't even taped. Um, so it, it can't be considered an air barrier anymore because you've put over the course of the house thousands of staple holes in the product, um, which are allowing air through. And then, I mean, the fact that the seams aren't even taped, uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of self-explanatory that it couldn't be an air barrier uh, when you have big gaps in the product. On, on the right, uh, you have what's much closer to a proper install of Tyvek, where uh, with a little more improvement, it perhaps could be considered an air barrier. The fasteners that are on it um, are called button cap nails or staples, and they create a hole with the plastic uh, cap on it, seals that hole. And then you can see all the openings are taped, uh, which seals them. And uh, again, if, if the product is installed properly, um, it could be considered an air barrier. Um, here's a product called zip sheathing that I'm sure a lot of you have seen as well on homes. Um, if done properly, uh, it does a much better job than Tyvek at achieving an air barrier on the exterior of the home, uh, just by the nature of the product itself. The, the green coating on it um, is the air and moisture barrier. Um, you have to tape the seams. Uh, seal over any nail holes, um, but if done right, uh, is a great product. On the right picture here is an example of how it could be done wrong uh, and be an ineffective air and vapor barrier. You can see right on the roller uh, tape, there's a picture of a roller, um, which they provide a proper roller for rolling the product onto the sheathing uh, in order to seal it. That was not done here. This is probably slapped on by hand. Uh, and the, contractor quickly moved on. Uh, then you can see a lot of the nails are what are called overdriven. Uh, they penetrate the sheathing. You can see the break in the green color and the wood. That's an opportunity for moisture to get into the product. Um, and again, it's, it's a great product until it's installed improperly. And then like any other product has its deficiencies. Um, some common gaps in the thermal boundary uh, that you might look for with a client could be an uninsulated and uh, non-weather stripped attic catch where air can simply move between the attic and the house uh, through the big hole used to access the attic. Uh, I would say 90% of the time we see them in existing housing stock, they're uninsulated and unsealed and that's uh, often a, a two by two, two by three hole in the ceiling uh, where air moves in and out That's, that's a pretty common attic that I'm sure many of you have seen with uh, a hatch that's simply a sheet of plywood laid on top of some trim, uh, insulation strewn about everywhere um, and ripe for uh, improvement. A, a duct chase or mechanical chase could be is another common leak uh, point in the air and thermal barrier. Uh, that's when you have a duct running through the wall up into an attic space um, or from a crawl space up into the house. Uh, they're often unsealed and provide an opportunity from air for air from the attic or crawl space to enter the home through the interior walls and then into the through the outlets, uh, et cetera, the, the vent, the vent grills. Um, again, uncontrolled airflow into the home. Another problem with chases, uh, leaky points, are that moisture from the home uh, can leak into the air, uh, or into the attic space, or moisture from the crawl space can leak into the home, uh, creating mold or moisture problems, uh, which then damage the home. Uh, common occurrences uh, beyond, beyond holes in the envelope where moisture leaks, you'll often see bath fans or dryer vents that are not properly vented to the outside. Uh, and then can create moisture problems in the house. We'll see this a lot in the winter time where above the shower that the family commonly uses, 
there's no there's no duct on the vent fan it's not taken to the outside so you're putting a lot of moisture within the building envelope and then it uh, in the winter time on a cold day can condense on the roof deck you see the nail the nails here frosting up and the sheathing itself frosting uh, likely a cold day where you're putting warm wet air into the attic uh, condenses and then freezes in summertime, it might look more like this, where you have improper attic ventilation, um, a dryer blowing into the attic because somebody stepped on the dryer vent pipe, uh, a bath fan not vented. You blow wet air into the attic, it condenses on the sheathing, and then you have mold uh, within your building envelope, even though uh, if done right, it, you wouldn't see this. Uh, some common leak points, you might see a, a plumbing pipe like this, dirty insulation around it, and insulation is capturing the dirt and dust from the air as the air moves from the attic into the house. There's a chase with a lot of black insulation around it. Uh, all, these, all these openings can be sealed with foam, caulk, uh, or a comparable product, and, and the insulation can be rendered, once again, effective. Uh, but if you have an insulation product like blown fiberglass that you're seeing here, it's, it's not designed to stop airflow. So you, so you have to create an airtight plane at the ceiling level um, or at the interior of the building if, if you're using a, an insulation product that doesn't stop airflow uh, in and of itself. Uh, wire holes here that were never sealed during the construction project as they should. Uh, all common leak points where air from the attic that's say 130 degrees in the summer is now pouring into your interior walls. Uh, and then uh, you're having to pay to, to cool that air uh, from there. Uh, but uh, fiberglass insulation can be an effective insulator. Uh, no, no qualms with the product. You just need to make sure, again, you have a continuous air barrier between the inside of the home and the outside of the home. Uh, here's something you'll often see in a crawl space when you look up, plumber goes to run, um, say, the, the trap for the tub drain, uh, and instead of cutting a hole that fits the pipe, they, they take their saws all to it and cut a, a two square foot hole to make their life easier. Uh, but then you have a vented crawl space, um, and then it's just allowing wet, un unconditioned air from the crawl up into the house. Um, you'll see the same thing behind tubs where uh, sheathing is not installed on the wall behind the tub and air, air leaks in and people often complain that their tubs and showers are the cold spots in their houses because a proper air barrier is not installed. Other construction details that can result in pressure and thermal boundaries or changes in ceiling heights. Uh, because the wall turns vertically in the attic and end up uninsulated, uh, where you don't just have a flat layer of insulation across the attic. Uh, knee wall attic spaces and say a Cape Cod home or story and a half uh, home are filled with details uh, that uh, are just uh, common spots where air leaks into the house or the insulation and air barrier, or the thermal and air barrier are not aligned. AJ will touch on that in a bit. Uh, walk up attics, drop soffits above cabinets um, and bathrooms are all spots where insulation is often installed above them, but the air barrier being the drywall drops down to a lower level and the air barrier and thermal barrier are no longer touching. Here you see an example of a change in ceiling height. Uh, it creates a vertical wall in the attic that often goes uninsulated or does not have an air barrier uh, properly installed. Um, that can also create an open chase into the wall itself uh, if proper blocking is not installed. So here you see uh, the change in ceiling height. The wall goes vertically into the attic and each one of those bays just has an opening from the attic down the entire wall. Uh, so I could venture to say in the summertime, you put the, your hand on that wall, uh, it's probably 130 degrees, much like the attic. Um, 
in the winter time, that wall is very cold. Um, so you're paying, paying to condition outside air uh, when simply uh, foaming that opening shut or putting wood block in there uh, would create the proper air barrier required to separate outside air from in. Here's a photo of that same detail. Often seen in older housing, a, a lot of newer housing stock would have blocking there as required by code and a building inspector would catch it uh, before uh, it goes to drywall, but uh, I mean, they make mistakes too that I've seen. Um, so here your outside attic area is blowing down that wall cavity. It's easy because you need your purse be. Here's a common detail you might see in a kitchen uh, or a bathroom, laundry room where you have cabinets and your ceiling level drops down to, to meet the cabinet. Uh, it's called a soffit and your insulation goes across the ceiling level, uh, your drywall drops down and you have a big warm spot above those cabinets. Uh, one of the common reasons why people complain that their cabinets are so cold in the wintertime when they open them up. There you, there you see the detail where the insulation uh, goes across the, the flat ceiling level, but the ceiling level drops and, and you no longer have your air and thermal boundaries aligned, uh, creating that cold spot. And there's a, an example of it in real life. Uh, a, guy, a guy is testing with a blower door um, and, and it's called a manometer, test pressures if, if that barrier is properly sealed. One more view of it here. Uh, some more common spots for leakage, a, a range hood from your kitchen that runs up into the attic, the plumber or the HVAC guy cuts a big hole for it. Uh, the edges of it are not sealed. And then you have air pouring into your, your kitchen. You're wondering why it's so cold standing above your stove, uh, where you, if you went up into the attic, you'd see a big hole and ceiling level that could be sealed very simply um, to resolve that issue. More open wall cavities from the attic into the living space. Um, and here you have the one and a half story Cape Cod house filled with opportunities uh, for improvement typically. And uh, I'll let AJ take over from here. <clears throat> Hey guys, I'm AJ with Creative Conservation. I'm the Charlottesville branch manager. Um, we are an insulation company. We also do waterproofing and uh, crawl space encapsulation, mold treatment, uh, et cetera. So we're on Cape Cod. Um, other slides. Yeah, here. Six. Okay, sorry guys. <laughs> Trying to see. Um, no words with it. Okay, so for a Cape Cod, um, that's a unique type of roof assembly. There's a few different ways to address it. And uh, usually what I do is look at where is the HVAC unit. Um, because we always want to bring that inside of the building envelope. Um, sometimes you'll see a Cape Cod with knee walls where there's duct work behind those walls. Um, so the best practice for that would be to, if there is insulation on the knee wall, um, to remove it from there and move the thermal plane to the underside of the roof deck. Um, this would effectively bring the duct work inside of the thermal envelope. So if there's any duct leakage, it's no longer lost. It's still being contained inside of the home's thermal envelope. Um, same thing with the, if you look at the top, there's the triangle at the peak. Um, same thing, if duct works up there, it's a better practice to convert the thermal plane to the underside of the roof. Um, and then the slopes are an area that tend to really let a lot of heat radiate through. Um, for a 
flat ceiling attic space, there's room for the pressure to move, um, for the air to kind of flow around. So it's not being impacted quite as bad from the outdoor temperature. Um, but the slopes, it's drywall, hopefully insulation in there, and then the roof. Um, so that's an area that can be remedied. Um, most times when I see a Cape Cod, it's usually a no-brainer to convert it. Um, if it was traditionally insulated with insulation in the flat ceiling and in the slope, um, we convert it to a full foamed roof deck where we remove all the insulation from the knee walls, from the flat ceilings, and if it's accessible, um, from the slopes. And instead we foam into the roof uh, and on the gable walls behind those knee walls. Um, something to look at when you do run into a Cape Cod to make sure if it's uh, pre-home inspection, make sure it's covered with insulation is look behind the knee walls. Um, you can usually see up into the slope if you get in there and you should have a pretty good gauge on how well it's insulated. Um, you also should want to see ventilation baffles, which are styrofoam chutes. Um, anytime there's a sloped ceiling, those should be up against it or there could be a humidity issue. Uh, let's see what else we got. And so that's showing the traditional method um, where the thermal envelope is the flat ceiling uh, above the first floor behind the knee walls, the knee wall, and then the slope, and then the flat ceiling there. And then that continues down with the exterior walls. And we get a lot of calls for Cape Cods. Um, a lot of times it's because they were, some of them were built pre-code, so they weren't insulated adequately when they were built. And also the slopes, again, that really impacts the um, comfort upstairs because it's just drywall, insulation, roof deck. All right, so this is another example where you have a knee wall. Um, going science stuff. <laughs> Should have went through this video. Just show me how long it's very long. So, yeah, with spray foam, I mean, it makes sense to run up the walls um, and then it's showing um, where the roof could have insulation in the flat ceiling. Um, but again, if there's ductwork up there, it makes more sense to convert the thermal plane to the underside of the roof deck. Uh, and that would be concurrent from the eave all the way up to the peak. Um, the roof is really the biggest area of concern when it comes to insulation. 70% of heat is lost through the roof. Um, so it really affects the, your utilities and your home's comfort more than the walls, more than the crawl space. Um, but the crawl space would be a kind of a close second when it comes to where your energy loss is going to be, uh, especially in the rim joists where the floor sets on the foundation wall. So here's another area that uh, air can leak through. We have different methods. If we retrofit or insulate a home, the traditional method for the attic where we insulate the flat ceiling, something we always wanna make sure to do is the attic air seal. And uh, James had mentioned it as well. We wanna seal around any penetrations going through the flat ceiling around wires, pipes, um, the top plates where a wall meets with a ceiling assembly, those are all areas that air is going to pass through. Um, so usually our work scope with something like that is seal around all of those, uh, add insulation on top of what's there if there is some, and we really want to aim to see R49. Uh, Department of Energy recommends that in our climate zone. New construction code is still R38. Uh, but I'd say nine out of 10 times that we do a retrofit, we're blowing to R49, because I know that's the trend, that's where code's gonna end up. So a fireplace here, that can be an area that you know, has a chase behind it. Uh, this is something that can be addressed. If we're blowing insulation on top, we just wanna make sure to block that off. Um, that's 
definitely an area where if it's like this, then it's going to be very uncomfortable around that fireplace because um, you have an uninsulated wall that's just butted up against the CMU or brick or stone, uh, allowing air to pass in there. So with new construction, it's very important that we caulk around all of the um, stacks, studs, seal around windows and doors. Um, it, for new construction code especially, it now requires us to caulk at the top and bottom plates in all the corners, anywhere that two wood assemblies are coming together um, vertically. Uh, and then the middle picture, you can see that's an example of the air sealing for an attic. Um, if existing insulation is there, we pull it back temporarily, seal around it, put the insulation back in place, or if it's new construction, same deal. We're insulating around anywhere that air can get through. So uh, like James said, the drywall can be an air barrier. So anything that has air leaking through is it's definitely necessary to seal up. So there's a few different ways to address this where a chimney is. I think at the end of the day, the end result should be that it's sealed from above, no matter what method, spray foam is always going to be best. Um, so I believe that was a hole similar to where the chimney was. That was the chase. And in that case, looks like they probably put some sort of blocking and then sprayed foam over it. Spray foam is a lot more effective than any other type of insulation. Um, like James had said, it's an air barrier. Um, if you get into using closed cell foam, which is usually better for a crawl space, but could be used for an attic, um, that's an air, vapor, and moisture barrier after two inches. And I know these are areas that always do come up on home inspections. Um, anywhere that air can be passing through it, it usually tells on itself. If there's insulation there, if it's fiberglass bat and you're in an attic, if you pull up the piece, there's going to be black marks on the fiberglass. They call that wind washing. And that's basically where air has made it through. And with that debris, dirt, etc., you can see where it's coming in. So that's again showing the barrier around so that cellulose isn't going down in the hole for the chimney. Um, we want to always pay special attention to fireplaces and chimneys when it comes to how it goes through the ceiling, especially if it's still being used. Uh, we want a non-combustible material up against it like rock wool um, or metal flashing if need be. You don't want cellulose up against it and especially if it's a foamed roof deck or if we're foaming the flat, you definitely don't want foam up against it because that could be a fire concern. So this is a tricky spot. It can be addressed. Um, if the only access, what you're looking at is more than likely there's a fireplace and then a soffit and then the exterior wall that was never insulated. Um, it might be hard to reach down in there. It, it can be done. Um, but that's definitely an area that can't be ignored. Uh, it would not be a good practice to just insulate the flat ceiling there. We would want to find a way to get down in there and insulate that wall um, more than likely with spray foam. Um, pretty much every other application, you have to be right up on it. Spray foam, we can get into tight spots that we wouldn't be able to otherwise see. This is called picture framing. Um, ceiling around any seams. Probably what there is there on the right edge is where two pieces of drywall go together. It might be a top plate. Um, so they're sealing around that, sealing around the edges, um, just to restrict how much air goes through. Um, so what we're working on with that is what's known as the stack effect. If you take a straw with water in it and put your thumb on it, it holds it up, it doesn't move. If you let go, it falls out. It's the same concept when it comes to the building envelope, when it comes to the ceiling. If there's air that can pass through because it's not sealed, then the energy can pass through just as fast. Um, if you seal all of it, 
it makes a cap that slows down the movement of that air. Not only is it an air barrier, but it also affects the pressure. It slows down how much it can move through. Um, and with that, heat still rises, but not nearly as fast. So that's a fully insulated attic. That's what we should expect. Um, when you're looking at homes that are insulated and the attic looks like it's fairly recent, something you definitely want to see um, is attic rulers. And those are um, pieces of cardboard that just have a gauge on it, like a regular ruler. Um, and that'll show you what the depth is so that you have an idea. Um, home inspectors usually like to see this. Um, and it should be a practice um, that was done during install so that you know really what you have that's in place without having to measure it yourself. This is a great example of an unvented attic. Um, so with the thermal envelope, there's really what helps me to determine which insulation package makes the most sense is if I have a customer call and they just say, my home's uncomfortable. And that's all they know is that their utilities are too high and that they're not comfortable. The first question I ask is, where is your HVAC unit? Is it in your attic or is it in your crawl space? And from there, that determines what would be the best practice. If their unit is <clears throat> in their attic, then hopefully we can have the opportunity to do just what you're seeing there. We remove the insulation from the flat ceiling and we spray foam in the attic gable wall, sealed vents, um, and spray under the roof deck. And what this does is completely seals the cap of that home. It brings the attic unit into the thermal envelope. Any duct leakage is not really being lost anymore. Um, it's helping to manage the moisture that's in the attic. Um, and it is essential that the insulation that is in place is removed where accessible because what you're then achieving is getting passive air movement from the attic to the home um, to help monitor moisture and help the temperature centralize. Typically an attic that is foamed like this, unvented attic, foamed roof deck, um, whichever term they're interchangeable, it's gonna be no more than about seven degrees different from the rest of the home, given that there's a unit in the attic. And I've seen evidence of even closer. Um, I've seen as close as two degrees different. If the unit is not in the attic, it would not be a good practice to foam into the roof deck. Um, the reason being there's not going to be enough air moving up there. It's going to create a dead air space and inevitably going to have moisture problems. This can be remedied with the dehumidifier if it's already done, but I would not design an attic with foam in the roof deck if the unit's not up there. If the unit isn't up there, then retrofitting as we had talked about um, with sealing any wire and pipe penetrations, doing an attic air seal, insulating the access and blowing insulation into the flat ceiling and any transition walls that need to be addressed where it's a vertical with the ceiling height change is gonna be the best practice. Um, and if it's the crawl space, it's really the same concept. Uh, if your unit's in the crawl space, you can convert it to a sealed crawl space, um, where rather than insulating the flat ceiling of the crawl, you're insulating the crawl space walls and sealing it with spray foam so it's completely sealed, not allowing any unconditioned air to make its way in or conditioned air to escape. Um, and same thing, if the unit's not down there, then there's always a retrofit that can be done for the flat ceiling of the or ceiling of the crawl space by putting new insulation in. Okay, so this is an example where a staircase is unconditioned space that's butted up to conditioned space. So that can be a breach. Uh, it's a common thing that we see. I believe there's a slide on it. An insulated airtight cover can be installed at the top of the stairwell. The pressure and thermal boundaries are aligned at the level of the attic floor. This approach brings the stairwell into the conditioned space. It's also cheaper and faster than the alternative. So there's two ways to address this. If you have a staircase that is part of the attic, basically, in our industry, we look at it as inside or outside. 
So the attic is outside, outside of the thermal envelope. The stairs are also outside of the thermal envelope because there's no duct work that's pushing air into it. And if there's not insulation separating it from the attic, it's one with the attic. Um, the pressure and thermal boundaries must be established at the stairs, stairwell walls, and door to the attic. Um, this approach leaves the stairwell open to the attic and outside of the conditioned space. So basically, to simplify, it, it can be done two different ways. You can either make a cap at the flat ceiling that's uh, lined up with the attic floor or the ceiling below and keep the steps inside of the envelope because you have a, um, a barrier at the top that's separating it. Or it's usually more difficult. You can do as it looks like this guy's about to do, where you drill into the walls that are in the staircase common to the living space and fill them with cellulose or spray foam. Um, and that extends the insulation down to those walls um, rather than at the cap. Um, that's usually just a case by case design driven approach, um, depending on what makes more sense, what's easier, um, and what coincides with the remainder of the work scope as far as what material is best um, to get it all sealed and efficiently. So yeah, that's what they're doing. They're drilling holes, um, blowing cellulose in, and then they're insulating that door. And then from there, it looks like they're sealing under the steps with spray foam. So that's another thing that's really important that I see coming up in a lot of home inspections and is if spray foam is used inside of a space that's being used for storage, then it has to be covered by something. It has to be covered by drywall, um, plywood, it, or a fire paint um, because otherwise the manufacturers uh you know they wouldn't pass it 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 has to be covered with some sort of barrier to protect it from fire if a space is being used for storage if you walk up into an attic and uh, there's foam in the roof deck and there's flooring in the attic it's being used for storage there should be paint on the foam we don't see it as often with crawl spaces but we will if we see a basement that butts up to a crawl space. The walls of the um, basement are insulated and it's clearly being used for storage. Um, then it should have the paint over it. It's not always easy to see. Sometimes it's a white color, so it almost looks like it's not there, but you can usually see a shadow where there's a discoloration around anything, like any gaps or any part that kind of sticks out you can usually tell if you look close um, but that is something to keep an eye on for maximum efficiency and comfort the thermal and pressure boundaries must be continuous and in contact with one another electrical and mechanical chases missing top plates knee walls drop soffits and changes changes in ceiling height are common trouble spots targeted air sealing defines the pressure boundary so I believe that's it. Okay, well, um, so I mean, with the thermal envelope, can is everyone just seeing a black screen? I stopped sharing, or we, did you still need to share your screen? I do not, nope. I just didn't know if y'all were just seeing a black screen. But <laughs> now now we, we see all the people. Good deal. Um, so the biggest thing with insulating and the biggest thing to look at when it comes to the thermal envelope is air sealing. Um, typically, attic is the most important. Crawl space is usually second. The walls are a very far third. Um, if I have someone call and they want insulation, it's always the attic first, unless the crawl space is in dire straits where it has mold and has zero insulation. If there's some form of insulation, the attic's gonna be first, the crawl space is gonna be second. And I've had customers that call, they have us do the attic, year goes by, they call us back, we do the crawl space, 
I can't say I've ever had a customer call back for the walls because they just don't make up much of the impact on efficiency. Hot and cold moves vertically a lot more than horizontally. Um, so there's not much energy that's being lost. If the home's on the side of a mountain up in wintergreen, the walls might be a bigger deal, um, but typically the attic is the biggest area of concern. The crawl space is second. Um, and there's two ways to address both, even three ways um, with the attic. Like I said, if the unit's up there from the roof deck, convert it to an unvented attic. If the unit's not up there, insulate the flat ceiling, which can be done with cellulose or for more price, but much more efficiency, you can also spray foam into the flat ceiling of the attic. And that seals it up very well. Um, so did anyone have any questions or? Yeah, thanks, AJ and James. You guys are awesome. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to submit it on Zoom chat. You can raise your hand or, um, and then we can unmute you and let you ask your question to James or AJ. There is one question in the chat. Um, what type of paint should you use to cover the spray foam? Uh, it's a code required paint called thermal barrier. Uh, each manufacturer has uh, one of several different paints uh, that are tested as an approved fire retardant over their foam. Uh, so it would depend on the foam that was installed. Uh, but there are a few generic products uh, called, one's called DC315 and others called No Burn uh, that are tested over the spray foam products uh, and would be effective fire retardants. Uh, but a lot of foams are tested where they, they don't need to have the paint installed over them depending on the application. Uh, for example, if, if an attic it, or crawl space isn't used for storage um, and it's just used to service utilities uh, or mechanicals, uh, then it probably uh, was installed by a contractor uh, who used a foam that didn't need uh, a, th a thermal barrier uh, paint coating over it. Um, so again, it depends on the application. It may or may not need paint, uh, but I, I would call a licensed insulation contractor if, if you think the, the foam was not covered appropriately and, the, and they would know which paint um, to use over it. I, I wouldn't call a paint contractor to do it. Yeah, here's another question. Um, what's a ballpark estimate for spray foaming an attic on say a thousand square foot floor plan with like a simple ranch roof line? Um, so you, so you, you're definitely going to want to remove the existing insulation first, uh, which is probably going to cost, uh, give or take a thousand dollars. And then I would say safely probably $2,500 to, to film the roof deck of a, a thousand foot rancher. So you're probably all in for $3,500 or so, give or take. Awesome. And is there a safety issue like with the painting as well? Like if you leave it exposed other than just the fire issue, is there a health and environmental hazard at all that you know of or no? no it's, it's a latex based product. Um, the bigger concern if you're having spray foam installed, uh, you're really not allowed to be in the house while it's done or for 24 hours after completion uh, due to the off gassing of the product. I mean, you are you're manufacturing plastic at the house, um, spray applying it, and um, there, there's some pretty noxious chemicals that go into it at that time, as, as with any other uh, plastic. Um, but, but having to manufacture it at the house, you're, you're experiencing that off-gas, off-gassing during the install and instead of in a factory environment where they can control it and you're just experiencing the end product. So really need to get out of the house for the day while it's done and uh, the night after. Great, excellent. Uh, what about when you're doing the envelope and you spray foam and then you remove the remaining um, insulation from the from the roof deck? Just say a little bit of, I think you guys <laughs> covered some of this, but 
what's the benefit of that or uh, removing that insulation from the roof deck? Um, so years ago, I mean, when foam roof decks first started being a thing, roughly 15, almost 20 years ago, I don't think many insulation contractors were removing that insulation. Um, what we found was a few different things. It really can create humidity in the attic unless there is a supply line that's blowing air. And even then, they're robbing themselves of some efficiency because they want to allow the conditioned air in the attic to centralize with the conditioned air in the house. Uh, and another thing that we found, even though it wasn't unsafe, because all off-gassing is done after you know, 24 hours at the most, is the fiberglass would soak up or whatever insulation would soak up the smell of the foam. Um, we would come back, we'd remove the insulation, smell was gone. And so we've just made it a practice for those reasons, centralization between the attic and the living space or the temperature, um, and then smell. We, wanna, we don't wanna leave that in there. Um, it can be a moisture trap. Um, even if you have air blowing up there, there's a chance that the condition up there, conditioned air upstairs is gonna be a different temperature from the conditioned air downstairs there's a difference in amount of pressure and then they can meet in the middle of the insulation that's there and it could get moist over time. So one other thing about removing the existing insulation, when, when you foam the roof deck, you, you've moved the thermal boundary, you, you've moved it from the attic floor to the roof. And now whatever's on that attic floor is part of the house. So you saw the pictures there of all that insulation with mouse feces, bat feces, urine, et cetera, dust, dirt, mold. That's now all inside your house because your attic's not breathing anymore. So I, I wouldn't want that in my home. Um, but yeah, that's, you, you brought that all indoors. It's no different. I mean, it's, it's separated from your living space, but it's, it's all part of your indoor air at that point because your attic's no longer in that space. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Thanks, guys. Anyone have any other questions? Well, guys, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, and everyone who attended today, you'll get a survey um, on the session next week via email. Please take a minute and provide us some feedback on how we can improve um, our future series. Um, and our next building, our, our next green building series session will be site and land. And it's on Friday, July 16th at 9 a.m. So make sure you go ahead and sign up for that site and land. Um, and uh, we're really grateful that you joined us. Thanks again to AJ and to James. Wish you guys the best of luck. I'm sure you'll have a busy summer and I'm sure we'll be in touch. So thanks for having us, Josh. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, everyone, have a great Friday.